Okay, nine months on, Koch's fears realized. I mean, you know, we, we live in Kokistan. Right? We no longer live in the United States of America. We now live in Kokistan. The Koch brothers decide who our, you know, who our, our, our politicians are going to be through Americans for Prosperity and the Tea Party and everything else that they fund. They decide what our policy decisions are going to be through the, through, the, uh, through the think tanks that they fund. They, they use their PR arms to make sure that all those people and all those ideas get on television and on radio every single day in the newspapers and the op-ed pages. Why don't we just rename the country? I mean, the Supreme Court has said billionaires can do whatever they damn well please. Let's just rename the country, Kokistan. I mean, it, you know, with the Istan part, it sort of sounds like a third world country, which is the direction we're heading. Right? When Ronald Reagan said government is not the solution to your problems, government is the problem. Spitting in the face of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. This is the new world. With a few exceptions, like Seattle, or SeaTac, excuse me, SeaTac, Washington, just outside Seattle. SeaTac put into place a $15 minimum wage. Bang. No phase in, no, it's going to be, you know, six years from now it'll be $15. We're going to rent nothing. Starting, you know, right away. Nine months ago. So here we are, nine months later. Now, at the time... A guy named Scott Ostrander, for example, who, was, who owned a business at, in SeaTac, he said, I am shaking here tonight because I'm going to be forced to lay people off. His business was the Cedarbrook Lodge Hotel. I am shaking here tonight because, because of this $15 minimum wage, $15 an hour minimum wage, because I am going to be forced to lay people off. I'm going to take away their livelihood. That hurts. It really, really hurts. And what I am going to have to do on January 1st is eliminate jobs, reduce hours, and as soon as hours are reduced, benefits are reduced. This is what he predicted. Nine months later, Cedarbrook Lodge Hotel is expanding, adding 63 more beds to meet demand. He's hiring people at $15 an hour. Tom Douglas, guy who runs 15 restaurants in the Seattle area, he said, a higher minimum wage, I'm going to have to shut down a quarter of my restaurants. The voters said, tough luck, $15 is a living wage. And Tom Douglas now is opening five new restaurants to meet the demand. Now, I realize that there are a lot of you who, who believed the, uh, maybe or a few of you, I, I, my audience I should give more credit to, uh, a few of you who might have believed the whole Reaganomics fantasy, the Scott Walker fantasy, this Sam Brownbeck fantasy, the Mitt Romney fantasy, the Republican Party fantasy, that if you cut taxes on billionaires, it'll create jobs. It'll stimulate the economy. Well, it turns out that's not true. You cut taxes on billionaires. Ronald Reagan cut taxes on billionaires, you know, first year in, in office. And what happened? We slumped into the the worst recession since the Great Depression happened in the second year of Reagan's presidency, right after his tax cuts. Now, shouldn't that tell us something? It took years. It took, I mean, it took basically the rest of his presidency to recover from that. And it still hadn't recovered, and it only did because he tripled the national debt to bail out the country from his tax cuts for billionaires. It's really, really simple. When people who spend all their income have a lot of money in their pocket, they make money. They, they, I mean, they, they, they spend that money, and that money stimulates the economy. Paul Bukait, uh, writing for BuzzFlash, writes a couple of things that we should know, and then I'm going to pick up your phone calls here. He says, for every billion dollars of new stock market wealth, you know how whenever cons go on, on you know, like it was, it was Sunday yesterday, so it's time to meet the Republicans. Melissa Harris-Perry had, had Annie Goodman on. That was really sweet. I was impressed. But the big show? No. If we're going to have a Democrat, it's going to be a moderate Democrat. And usually they don't even have Democrats on. 
But anyhow, for every billion dollars of new stock market, oh, and where I started with this thought was, you know, what they say, whenever they talk about the stock market and Social Security and all this kind of stuff, retirement, the cons will say, oh, you want to you want to mess with the, you want you want to tax dividends? You've got millions of, of seniors in the United States who are, who are getting dividend income as part of their retirement. You want to start taxing them? Well, no. See, the tax on, on capital gains, which is dividend income, which you get from owning stocks, that tax is a progressive tax. If your income is you know, under thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, whatever it may be, if, if, you're, if you're basically drawing Social Security in a small help from your from your stock portfolio, you're not going to pay any income tax on that, or it's going to be very very little. So here's the number: for every billion dollars of new stock market wealth, most of us average one dollar in stock gains. Most of us who are not the Koch brothers, who are not the billionaires, who are not Shelley Adelson. Number two: every year since the recession, the uh, richest ten percent have accumulated enough new wealth every year to pay the total cost of Social Security four times over. It's astonishing. And that, that top 10%, that's people who make one hundred and fourteen dollars to $140,000 a year and have at least six hundred grand in, in the bank or in you know, home equity or whatever it may be. It's 16 million families. They have increased their wealth by $4 trillion every year since 2008. Now, that's, that's the top 10%. Everybody else has increased their wealth? Eh, not at all. Workers paid, thir- and, and then, you know, then and now, right? In the 1950s, workers paid 33 cents in taxes for every dollar corporations paid in taxes. Today, for every 33 cents in taxes that workers pay, corporations, they no longer pay a dollar, which is what they paid during the Eisenhower administration or even the Nixon administration that, or the Kennedy or Johnson. They no longer, corporation no longer pays a dollar when you and I pay 33 cents. Now when you and I pay 33 cents, a corporation pays seven cents in taxes. Another story that you will not hear on the corporate media because, of course, it's corporations paying the taxes, right? They don't want you to know about that. In fact, Paul Bukite calculates that basically every year, every household in America is shelling out $10,000 in corporate subsidies. Meanwhile, the average taxpayer in the United States pays about $22 a year in income taxes to cover the cost of food stamps and programs for uh, women and uh, mothers with dependent children or families with dependent children. So, why is it that, they, that, the, that the cons have managed to get all of America so upset about the fact that they're spending $22 a year to support mostly working poor people with food stamps and whatnot? And nobody's upset that we're all spending $10,000 per household per year subsidizing corporate America. See, this is not the United States of America anymore. It's Co- it's Kokistan. And and you know, there's some parts of Kokistan that would like to split off and become Kokmenistan. Right? Texas, the South. We don't want no stinking federal rules. Amazing. 